of the Church of the Good Shepherd. And it's really my pleasure and my honor to introduce Ned, uh, to give you the perspective of independent schools in the CSRA because I consider him the primo source. So welcome, Ned Murray. So uh, Gerald Foley told us that Norman Vincent Peale talked to us about that attitude of, I can't wait for tomorrow. Well, let me tell you that when you have to follow General Jeff Foley at 8 o'clock in the morning, you can't wait for tomorrow. <laughs> not a way to start your day. He's, he is a great man. He's a good friend to our school. He's a great Augustan. You know, sometimes we ought to study the, the number of tremendous, talented people who retire from Fort Gordon and stay in this community. We ought to pull all of them together and ask them, what was it? And study that and build our community around that because he's a tremendous asset to all of us and a, and a great speaker. So I know that when I see St. Peter at the pearly gates, my first question is going to be, what did I do to have to follow him in a room <laughs> full of people at Augusta Tech? Um, and apparently it turns out the uh, AV equipment here is a federal employee. <laughs> uh, so um, I have a beautiful set of slides that I will send to you when the government is back working again. Um, in the meantime, uh, just envision, if you will. Uh, fortunately, most of my content is actually in the talk. You know, slides are just enhancements or things to keep you from getting too bored. Um, but it is 8 o'clock. You all have already been in this room probably about an hour. Let's just shake it up a little bit. I want to do an AV test, a sound check. If you can, This is how we do it in elementary school. If you can hear me, clap once. If you can hear me, clap twice. If you can hear me, stand up and clap six times. Thank you very much. My mother's birthday was Tuesday. She turned 90. I'm going to call her and tell her I got a standing ovation for that. Thank you for that. I'm really honored to be here. This is an incredible program. Leadership Augusta is. This I've seen, like General Foley, I've seen your bios. It's an impressive group. Uh, I'm incredibly intimidated to follow him and, and have him in the room, but I'm really especially happy to have the opportunity to speak at the front end of your day and maybe help frame your day a little bit. Um, I did. Some of you heard I did a talk two days ago at, at Leadership Columbia County at 3 o'clock in the afternoon at the end of their day. That's almost as hard a challenge as following General Foley. Um, but so I really want to, want to give you some context for today. My, my thoughts, I'm going to own them as mine, although my slides would have demonstrated that I'm not alone. Uh, own them as mine. But my thoughts about um, what I think of what is happening in the future of higher education. And the theme here is revolution. There's a beautiful slide of a revolution now in front of you. Um, I really truly believe that we're in a midst, that we, and oh, and by the way, apologies to my friends in higher education, including especially uh, Jim there. Um, but here's the deal. I really believe we are in the midst of a revolution in higher education that is so disruptive to the landscape that today's kindergartners, when they graduate from high school, 12 and a half years from now, there will be no such thing as a four-year residential brick-and-mortar college. In fact, I don't think there will be a four-year degree in that time period. So 71 million Google hits on a revolution in higher ed. Uh, there's also a slide that Harvard and MIT are responsible for a revolution in higher education. And there's also a slide of Tom Friedman headline saying, a revolution hits higher education. So it isn't just come from me. Now let me tell you about what I think this revolution is. Well, who are the revolutionary forces? Or what are the revolutionary forces? Okay. Um, uh, there really are forces attacking the current model. But let's talk about what the model is, okay? How do universities come to exist? First, Limited controlled access to great teachers, right? Back in the day, whether they were monks, practitioners, experts, uh, retired politicians, whatever, part of the model is what they offer is access to those people. Second is limited and controlled access to world-class resources, great libraries, state-of-the-art computers, etc. You with me? Third part of their business model is limited and controlled access to a great student population particular peer group of like minds. Um, so let's take the extreme example in the spectrum. You go to Harvard to have access to Harvard teachers and professors, Harvard resources, and the Harvard student body, right? That's really, those are really the only, you don't go to be in Cambridge. It's nice, but it's not that nice. So those are the reasons for going there. The problem is that entire business model is totally outdated. 
largely by this, right? So here are the revolutionary forces. First, this is a great slide. <laughs> Disruptive, accessible, and scalable new technologies, okay? This is one. Everybody's got one of these. You can take a Harvard course from this, wherever you are. MOOCs, do you know what MOOCs are, M-O-O-Cs? No? No. Okay, we don't have time to get into this. Massive open enrollment online courses, okay? We thought these were niche events for a while. Now, two of the three largest MOOC providers are funded, are nonprofits and funded by major universities. Stanford, MIT, Harvard, these are the schools getting into this. So, so that's one of the revolutionary forces. Radical new financial models that are changing the affordability problem and addressing the mounting student debt crisis we have in our country. That's force number two. Force number three, democratic and free market forces are at play in this. Quick example, Sally Blunt, the dean of uh, Northwestern University's Graduate School of Management, calls MOOCs one of the greatest equalizers in our culture since the printing press. Now think about how revolutionary the printing press was and its impact on our culture. She says we're in the midst of that same kind of revolution. Uh, fourth, breakthroughs in our ability to reliably and validly, if that's a word, assess skills. Real skill assessment, both cognitive skills and non-cognitive skills. We'll touch a little bit on that uh, a tad later. Um, so those are the four revolutionary forces. We don't have time today to unpack all of that, but I do have two or three separate talks about all of this. So if you have civic groups that are looking for a speaker, as long as General Foley isn't ahead of me, I'm happy to come, come talk to you. But here's what I want to do. I want to give you a few examples to make the case, to demonstrate to you that this revolution is actually underway right now outside these, these four walls. Last year, San Jose State, yeah, the beginning of last year, San Jose State changed the format of their gateway engineering course. Gateway means you have to pass it to stay in the program. They changed the format. What happened is in the new program, students, for their homework, watched the MIT, and, uh, it was uh, circuits and electronics. So for homework, they watched the MIT course and did the exercises. And when they came to class, the first 15 minutes was questions. They reserved the rest of the time for discussion, analysis, and application. The passing rate had been 60%. They were only getting 60% of their students through that course. With this new blended approach, see it's online and in person. There's no just one thing as online learning. In the new blended approach, the passing rate went to 90%. Now, who is that revolutionary for? It's revolutionary for those students who passed. It's revolutionary for the institution that keeps students in school. And it's revolutionary for us because we get more engineers in American workforce. It's huge, okay? Uh, example number two, Harvard. Back to Harvard again. I don't, I don't mean to hold them up. It's just the brand name we all know. Harvard no longer teaches introductory accounting. You know why? Is it because their students don't need it? Oh gosh, no. It's because there's a professor at Brigham Young University whose online course is just so good, Harvard students take that instead. Now, Thomas Friedman, here he is again, his take on this is, he says, this tells us that when excellent is so accessible, average is over. Now think about that. That's revolutionary and has some chilling implications on both sides that we'll get to. Okay, now here's one that is truly revolutionary. It's a great slide here, the MOOC the Roar. Georgia Tech, Georgia Tech has taken, um, they, they announced this last night, they, have, they currently have an on-campus uh, master's degree program in computer engineering. They have capacity for about 300 students on campus. They've been charging, you know, out, their out-of-state tuition is what, $45,000 plus, okay? They've taken this one program transformed it to an entirely online course. Complete, uh, not course, sorry, pro degree program, master's degree, completely online, never have to set foot on campus. Here are the numbers. They tell you in public speaking, don't hit them with data. This data you're gonna, you're gonna be interested in. They go from capacity of 300 students to capacity of 10,000. They're adding fewer than eight instructors and they're charging tuition of, wait for it, wait for it, $6,600. 
or a motivated young man in public housing in South Augusta. Okay? And to more kinds of learners. Let's face it, the reality is this classroom setting works well for a couple of kinds of learners and really, really not well for a lot of other kinds of learners. Now there will be multiple modalities for lots of different kinds of learners who don't have to feel like they're failures. They will find the path and the resource and the, and the tools for success. So that's revolutionary. So accessibility. Number two, self-paced. You need to walk, watch the lecture two or three times to get it? You can. You don't have to fail the course the first two times. You want to take, you're capable of taking algebra in sixth grade? You don't have to wait for everybody to catch up anymore. We have a student doing this in my school right now. You want to start college while you're in high school? You don't have to make the choice and you don't have to drive across town to do it. Take a Harvard course during your free time or negotiate your way out of one of the courses that you can have mastered. You with me? Okay, self-paced. Three, assessment-based. The model has to shift from time served to stuff learned. We all have diplomas and resumes. Most of what that tells anybody is how much time we spend with our butts in a seat in a classroom. It doesn't really tell anybody what we can do or what we know. We all pretend it does. You people, do you hire people and interview people? Do you look at resumes? When you look at a resume, do you see where they went to school and what they studied? You think that tells you something. You probably know it doesn't, but we still pretend it This is a house of cards that it's about to crumble, and what will do it is new assessment technologies, okay? That's awesome. And finally, individualized programming. Who got together and said 124, 128, whatever it is, semester hours, is what it takes to be an educated citizen in America? Who figured that out? Why? Learners will now be able to chart their own course through the education system and pick and choose and mix and match according to their strengths, their needs, and their vision. And there will be influence from industry. What are we looking for? But the middleman trying to control the gateway is gone. Sorry, Jim. Uh, I'd like to do, we don't have time, I'd like to do an exercise right now where everybody throws their shoes in the center of the room and then grabs a different pair and puts them on. Okay, response number one, obstacle number one is the U factor. <laughs> obstacle number two is the moment where you say, but I paid this for my shoes and I'm not sure you did. The fact of the matter is the range of price of shoes in this room I've checked isn't that great. No one has on a $5,000 pair of shoes even though they exist. But what's the real obstacle? Once we get over the U factor and figure out the value in that grade, we're going to get your shoes back. What's the real obstacle? They're not going to fit. If one size of shoe doesn't fit all, what in the world makes us think one size of education will? If our feet aren't the same, you think our brains are? It's craziness. Okay. Uh, characteristic number whatever we're on, the slide will tell you. Um, <laughs> of forces in education. Affordable. All right, I've made my case. It's becoming affordable. Access will no longer be reserved and preserved for the wealthy and the people who have the time and wherewithal to travel. And finally, and, and General Foley talked about this, the final characteristic of the education of the future of higher education is it will be lifelong. It won't just stop at graduation. It can't. In fact, there may not be a graduation. It'll be more like the path you get on and stay on that he talked about. So, here's what I think it'll actually look like. First of all, what colleges and universities are going to do, they're in the process of doing, is they're going to, they're going to revolutionize their curriculum to differentiate those courses and those skill bases that, are, that, that can be learned from a distance or in some blended environment. From those skill bases, that have to happen in an immersive, interactive, interpersonal culture. That, those are there, right? I mean, let's face it. Do you want your plumber or your surgeon to have only gone to online school? Of course not. Do you care if she learned her math that way? Probably not. What about their art history or sociology? Fine. So we're going to differentiate, I think. That'll be number one. 
Um, so then you imagine that the higher education experience, the post-secondary education experience begins to look like this. You might take 5, 10, 12, 15 courses online or in some blended uh, 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 online learning, maybe even beginning while you're in high school. Then add a semester at the University of Georgia in the field with their scientists immersed in biology, natural sciences, ecology, and maybe another semester at Georgia Tech immersed in a robotics and problem-solving marathon. Or maybe that's a quarter or a month. Maybe you decide you want to pick up that week at Valdosta State because they have a killer public speaking program. And maybe you decide you want to go to Mercer for that week and a half intensive course in conflict management they offer. Got it? So this leads to my second prediction, that the degree system will die. Instead of putting together these four-year comprehensive packages, the, the, the winners in this revolution, see this revolution, just like every other, is going to have casualties, it's going to have survivors, and it's going to have victors. So the schools that are victors in this will be those that figure out how to offer a complex menu of offerings, online, on campus, in between, and, and a menu of immersive, intensive, on-campus experiences that you have to have. But they don't necessarily have to do it all, and new brands will learn. I mean, in this model, if we have good assessment, then why can't SunTrust offer a course in commercial banking? Or, or Merrill Lynch, a course in public finance? Why not, if the assessment is good, right? Anybody think the air conditioning is on furlough today, too? Or is it just me up here? <laughs> um, so take a school like Belmont College. You guys have heard, ever heard of Belmont College in, in, in Nashville? Not Belmont Abbey. What, OK, so what is, it, what is it known for? What are you known for? Music. The music industry, best on the East Coast for, you know, whether it's engineering, marketing, management, the music industry, they're tied into Nashville, they're awesome at that, and that's what they should do. Why should they also pretend to be as good as anyone else at teaching math? Let somebody else teach math. They should do that and run twice as many kids through that program. So, prediction number three, the resume as we know it is dead. What you can do and demonstrate will be, actually already is, more important than where you went to school or for how long. So instead of a college degree from one school or a couple of schools, you've collected now a series of certificates of mastery that demonstrate the skills and experiences you've had, and you've put them together to match a particular marketplace desire that you know is out there. So what will students need to navigate this world? This is the question that guys like me have to ask. So when you're looking at the K-12 schools today, Say, how are they preparing kids for this world? Reading, writing, arithmetic aren't enough. If our focus is minimum literacy, that's important for a democracy, but not sufficient. Our students no longer will be able to just ride the current, get into school, maybe pick a college and a major. That's all you really had to do. And the current took care of the rest. That will not be the case anymore. Those kids maybe, maybe will be survivors. They won't be the victors in all of this. So there will be winners and losers. Now, I think, here's my last point, I think the difference in the students between the casualties, the survivors, and the victors will be the set of, for lack of a better term right now, non-cognitive skills they develop. Not their academic skills, the non-academic skills, the interpersonal skills. The best slide in my presentation is up right now because it lists about 50 of these for you to think about. Uh, a, a moral compass, leadership skills, public speaking, interpersonal, cultural competencies, perseverance, persistence, grit, problem solving. How, how many of the, which, do, which academic department do those things line up with? Which major gets you those things? Right? You see what I'm saying? And yet we've structured this system to hyper focus on the cognitive when we all know it's those non cognitive skills that especially in this brave new world will make the difference. Far more than SAT scores, than your calculus grade, or even your IQ. Lots of research to demonstrate this. So, this gets to why I'm thinking about this, and reading about it, and talking to you about it. Let's talk for a minute about what this means for you. One thing this means for you individually, and I touched on it earlier. From your standpoint, you, we, better start paying attention to our learning portfolio. He's doing a great job of trying to encourage you to read and attack your ongoing learning. Be 
because you will, we will compete with people who have done this. If you're relying on your resume, if you are relying on your resume, your education and experience to get you through the rest of your career, unless you're retiring next week, think again. Because you will compete either for a job or for a customer, right, or for an employee with people who are paying attention to these lifelong learning portfolios. So that's something for you. That's my personal gift for you. But today's topic is to you as leaders in this community. You're going to go look at, at what's happening in education. And, and what I want to say to you is I think it's vital to our democracy. I think it's absolutely wonderful that we have a variety of kinds of schools, that we are blessed in this community to have a variety of kinds of schools. One size does not fit all, and we know this. And as a democracy, we have to have schools that meet and strive to get kids to minimum literacy skills, language literacy, numerical literacy, and civic literacy. We have to have that. But that doesn't create victories, okay? It's also great that there's a role for specialized schools, schools that maybe focus on a narrow, specialized range of skills, right? Like a trade school or what we used to call vocational schools or even a special needs school. There's a role for that. Specialized schools can also be schools that use a particular uh, teaching methodology, a Montessori school or a Reggio Emilia school, okay? Specialized schools can also be schools that maintain and espouse and teach a particular ideology or, or a lot of times in our case, theology. The Catholic schools come to mind, Jewish schools that are part of their mission is to maintain a particular culture and theology or, or certain Christian schools are this way, okay? But if I'm right about this revolution in education, and if I'm right about the ways in which the world is changing, even a little bit, then those students who come out on top will not be students who've come out of these narrow, purposeful schools. The students who come out on top and lead the way for us and our children in this brave new world will be the students, I believe, who attended schools that paid attention to their entire cognitive, non-cognitive, and I would add even spiritual. So that's where schools like ours, let's get back to the beginning, I'm here representing independent schools of Augusta. Three schools, Augusta Prep, Westminster Schools of Augusta, and my school, Episcopal Day School. We've joined together. We're the only three members of the National Association of Independent Schools. We're very different and differentiated. We have some things in common, and this is one of them. It's our reason for being, it's our purpose, it's our missions. This is what we do so well. If you have a minute during the break, I'll tell you why my school does it better. Yeah. <laughs> um, we do offer a, a different brand version of it, okay? We offer, we're not the same, but we're the same in this way. And so this is what we do. We build an enriched culture and set of programs that do three things. Focus on the individual child, Build a community of challenge, support, service and respect, and most importantly, focus as much energy as we possibly can in programs and time and resources on developing these non-cognitive skills. It's in our missions that this is part of what we do. My school does it focusing on the pre-K through eight years, and we do it in an inclusive theological way so that kids from all faith backgrounds can still get a theological uh, background, biblical training, uh, learning the Judeo-Christian history and texts, worship together, be part of a community that prays together, uh, but still come from different backgrounds, end of commercial. All right, got to end. My purpose here was four things this morning. Number one, to convince you that the world is changing rapidly and a revolution in higher education is underway as a result. Have I convinced anyone? A few, okay? The rest of you see me later, we've got some remedial work to do. <laughs> see, this is the difference the slides would have made. You're visual learners. Everyone who just didn't put up your hand is a visual learner. Number two, to convince you that a diversity of kinds of schools from which to choose is a good thing. Anybody believe that? Okay, a few more. Interesting, that's more popular. Number three, the schools that survive this revolution will be those that adapt adopt and differentiate. Adapt to the changing environment, adopt new learning and teaching modalities, adopt new financial models, and differentiate themselves from the rest of the marketplace. 
geography won't cut it, and the brand name won't cut it. Anybody convinced? I saw some nodding heads. Thank you. And finally, to convince you that the schools that prepare students for top levels of success in life, levels of meaning, levels of satisfaction, levels of influence on their communities, the students that do those things will be the ones who went to schools that paid careful attention to their non-cognitive skill development. Have I convinced anybody? Uh, okay, we need to talk. We have a little tutorial session. That's fine. I just wanted to get a few people in the room because, you know, that's pretty good for 8 o'clock in the morning, right? All right, thank you very much for your time. Have a great day. I want to come back and hear from you what you saw that confirms this and what you saw that challenges this or refutes this. Uh, they have any questions for Mr. Murray? I just want to congratulate you for being chosen as one of the speakers for